No te whenua rāhu i o tititia, ki te hākau tai toka, no te wahi pauna me o wakatipu, hurino o ki ngā wai pō karekare o tākau. Ko tēnei wahi o tākau, he whatu manawa o ngā tangara noho aki nei. Doc's 25 years old this year, and that's a significant achievement in itself. And of course it brought together disparate government departments, melded them into one, and over the period of time has become a very significant contributor to looking after what's precious in New Zealand. One of the things that's, that's really apparent is the passion that people that work for DOC bring to the task. And over the years, those people have worked more and more with others that are equally passionate in their own and different ways. And I believe that's something that we can be really proud of alongside the protection of the species, of the ecosystems, of the places that we take care of and the facilities that we've built and the number of visitors that we look after. I think it's a fantastic achievement. We've got better conservation of, of albatross just because there's more of them in the colony now. We've got improved conservation of dual gecko where they are now formally protected. New Zealand sea lions where they're, they're now breeding on the Otago Peninsula. We now found that we can kill stoats effectively to allow mohua to breed successfully. We found that that has caused some problems with rats, but we're also able to attack rats. We're able to predict when the rats are going to be bad from the temperature data loggers that we have in the forest that give us 18 months warning of when we're likely to have a problem. The major achievements of the Yellow-Eyed Penguin Trust over the last 25 years have been to stabilise and grow the number of breeding pairs of yellow-eyed penguins from a low of around 150 breeding pairs on the mainland in 1990 to between 450 to 550 breeding pairs on the mainland um, in 2012. Uh, with the non-migratory galaxids, we now actually know where all the fish are. So we've done good work on the distributions. We've done very good work on the ecology. So we know where they spawn, how they spawn, the requirements to spawn. We are now working along with Fish and Game to actually do some trout removal in, in a few key sites. We're here up at McRae's Flat and this uh, fence behind us is designed to exclude all mammals, all of the predators, to protect two lizard species that are found here, Grand Skinks and uh, Otago Skinks. So this fence was the first time that Doc has, at, certainly at this sort of scale and in Otago, used a structure like this to exclude all of the mammal predators and thus be able to prove that removing predator pressure allows these two critically endangered skink species to recover back towards normal population levels in this environment. And now, since 2005, there are four times as many lizards inside that fence as there were when it was first built. I think the aerial 1080 programs uh, we've done for Operation Arc and the Dart and the Catlins have been very successful. Probably my milestone would be the introduction of the Judas technique um, on goats and the shot over, and then more recently introduced it into Himalayan tar. We pioneered it. We, um, it was all based on the use of helicopters, and from that point on, once we got our systems working, it was very cost effective and halted the spread of goats into Mount Spore National Park. Wilding ponds are significant woody weeds uh, that are invading the tussock grasslands predominantly and forest environments and displacing the native biodiversity, which is unacceptable from a conservation point of view. Six or ten years ago, we would have put a crew on the ground. We would have been using chainsaws. Uh, it would have taken, say, a crew of six, three to four days to fell a hectare uh, at a cost of around $4,000. Today, I can do a hectare in about nine minutes. Uh, at a cost of five to six hundred dollars. So that's, that's aerial boom spraying versus ground crews on, on heavy infestations. Well, of course, the formation of DOP meant that we actually got into managing rare plants. So we, it was already quite a bit known about some of them, but we did some really good surveys and then we started conservation management, actually protecting them from the things that are destroying them. The acquisition of Flat Top Hill in 1992 was um, quite an unusual departure for the department because Flat Top was a, a lowland area and it was fairly, um, fairly degraded. It was weedy and rabbits had been allowed to, um, to do their worst at the site. 
As it's turned out, it's been a really interesting research site because um, stock have been absent for 20 years and we've been able to measure the changes that occur in, in dryland landscapes. Yeah, well historically New Zealand has been strong in conservation, but we've emphasised the high mountains and tall forests. And the non-forest areas, the shrublands, the wetlands, the grasslands were virtually ignored, something to be developed. And uh, the big change with Te Papa Nui, of course, was achieving in tussock grassland over 20,000 hectares, one of the probably most extensive areas of upland tussock grassland left in New Zealand. Appropriately, the department referred to it as a waterland park, and that indicates its economic value, because Dunedin City gets at least 60% of its water supply from the Te Papa Nui tussock grassland. Believe it or not, Tenure Review is 21 years old, this year and the most obvious conservation outcome from Tenure Review in Otago has been the creation of three new conservation parks. We've got examples like Otiaki Conservation Park that provides a real range of tracks for people to ride horses on, ride push bikes on, four wheel drive on and so it's provided a, a real range of different experiences from what we had 20 years previous. Otago Central Rail Trail is approximately 150 kilometre long ex-railway line that's now converted into a cycleway. The original concept uh, when it was developed really was, was quite radical because there was nothing quite like that in New Zealand operating at the time. This was a, a trail that went through um, developed farmland as opposed to what we would traditionally put trials which was in national parks or reserves, the natural landscape. So this was a very radical shift. The Central Otago Council have assessed the benefits in their area in excess of $12 million per year and employment opportunities for people. Rail trails everything to trail journeys. Uh, quite simply, if the rail trail wasn't here, trail journeys wouldn't be here. Some of the milestones for me and Doc have been seeing good investment into um, public amenity areas and high use areas that uh, have needed upgrading. Some of those are campsites, some of them are huts and tracks, um, road end facilities. The Rootburn track is, is now a world famous walking track, one of New Zealand's great walks with a, a serviced hut network. There are guiding facilities and there's several thousand people a month cross the Rootburn track, either um, as day walkers or independent or guided walkers. So it's a, it's a major part of New Zealand's tourism infrastructure now. Over the last 10 years, we've actively been sort of restoring and providing opportunities for people to stay and enjoy uh, the old musterers' huts and pastoral huts, which are part of our pastoral history out there in the landscape of Otago. Some of the most significant historical sites that have been restored in Otago would be Mace Town, Chinese Settlement, and the Skipper School, Mitchell's Cottage near Alex, and uh, the Shoelite Mines up in Wyuna near Glenorchy. There's been a whole shift about the philosophy behind maintenance of heritage uh, over the last 20, 30 years. In the past it was about taking something and replacing all of the bits that were damaged or broken, whereas now what we do is we try and preserve as much of the original fabric, particularly the old workmanship, so that we can read the building through the years. We've got things like cafes in the Alexandra Courthouse. We've still got actively used community halls in places like St Bathans, which are used by the community for a range of purposes. So interpretation in the past would have been a lot more text dense and a lot more factual and we've learnt the importance of telling stories and more photos and more images and engaging people. So now at the Visitor Centre we've even got things like touchscreen, so people can look through information in their own time, they can have a play and it's, it's an engaging technology, it's a different way of getting information to people. And all the interpretation panels, there's a lot less facts, it's a lot more, a lot more stories, more images, we've just got a lot smarter in the way that we give information out to the public. The other thing that has played a very important part with the department's standing is the establishment of Conservation Week and of course going out to the young people in the schools and getting them not only interested intellectually but also in a practical way. Yeah, I believe um, 600 young people have been through Conservation Corps in Coastal Otago under the DOC umbrella. The program was designed for 
young people unemployed between the ages of 16 and 25 and the Conservation Corps program evolved around recreation, education and of course conservation. The course for me was a stepping stone between um, being a young motivated individual with a passion for conservation and turning that into a, a job and hopefully a career. We've done so much work for the coastal Otago area. It would be fantastic to see that happening in other conservancies. Well I'm, I'm very proud of what we've achieved over those 25 years but it hasn't just been the Department of Conservation. It's been a number of uh, private partnerships, uh, trusts and other individuals who have made the progress in Otago that we're very, very proud of. And there's some really good examples, places like the Orokinoi Eco Sanctuary. Uh, also the work that the Allied Penguin Trust has undertaken. But there are uh, numerous other uh, joint projects and partnerships that happen throughout the whole of Otago. The Otago Settlement Act gave us the opportunity to create mechanisms that improved the working relationship and uh, particularly established mechanisms like the Tōpuni that valued, identified uh, our special places. When I started at Macro in 94, I think we had something like three concessionaires for Mount Spine National Park. Now in Wanaka there's something like about 120. In, in Wakatipu, Queenstown here we've got ski fields, we've got bungee jumps, we've got jet boat rides and, and really developing the relationships over, over the recent years uh, and with a different commercial and a more professional approach has been uh, the biggest change I've seen. So over the last 25 years, DOCS really achieved a huge amount of work and we can be really proud of that. But we now have to look forward and the challenge is still big. Uh, it's really important that we build on the work that's been done and look forward to working with the communities, with the people, with, with the organisations in this country that want to help make New Zealand a better place. Thank you.